One way to get to know the land you live on is to take a walk through the woods. A land's trees can help you piece together its history. And since about 70% of our land is forested, we figured there is much for us to learn. In order to help us read the forest through the trees, so to speak, we asked Michael DeMunn, a local forester, conservationist, and adopted member of the Seneca Hawk Clan, to walk the land with us. Michael, who is of both French English and Seneca Onondaga heritage, has helped preserve thousands of acres of forest in the region, and even shares a plaque at a local preserve with one of my longtime mentors, Tom Eisner, who passed away 10 years ago. Even though our forest has been logged and is relatively young, as you'll find out, there are always some surprises that are revealed. Do you know what kind of spruce trees these are? Because these were obviously planted here. Some of them are not doing so hot. Some of them are getting a little chlorotic. And we might have to take out a few. He planted a lot of non-native stuff here because he was a horticulturist. Yeah. They appear to be white spruce. Yeah. They're a softer one. Yeah, we haven't seen any, um, haven't seen any, uh, cones on this one, but yeah, it's a soft one. It's not prickly. This is your white ash. Yeah. And it's going to be... All our ash are going. Yeah, it's, it's sad. Uh, I would encourage you, it, there's no sign of the bar yet on here. No, there's no blonding yet. There's some down on the thing that are really bad, uh, like on the oh, way yeah. up. I saw some just down the road there. Yeah. No, there's no uh, activity yet in here, so that's good. So what is, what is your uh, take on it when there's no activity? Do you, should you, I know some people say cut it down so you can get the wood, and then other people are like, well, keep it up. Well, I'm a believer in that some trees will survive. Yeah. And this whole, this thing about cutting every ash that's there, if you if you look back during the time of the chestnut plight, there's no doubt that there were trees that were resistant that got mm -hmm. cut down, mm -hmm. and that's tragic. And so I think it's a bit premature. So when I am uh, doing my timber marking, if I see a really superior ash, mm -hmm. then I, I will leave it. Mm. You know, and uh, with the hopes that it'll survive. And, you know, as you may know, that the insects and diseases, be they on trees or humans or animals, whatever the case may be, is uh, kind of density dependent. So the more density you have of a given species, the, the greater the likelihood that they will be attacked, mm. you know, and, and, and so therefore, my goal is is to uh, is to eliminate the, the lightning bug. I think. Yeah, is to eliminate the proportion of ash. Like I think the elms in New York, for instance, yeah. got in trouble because they had planted rows of elms, yeah. oh. right? And it's easy Way for the much. insects to go from one to the other. Oh yeah, exactly. And but if it's an ash in the middle of hickory and you know maple oh, and yeah. spruce and everything, then it's less likely to maybe hop over. You exactly. Know? And one of the the hallmarks of uh, intelligent uh, management is, is species diversity. Uh, by far, if you keep a uh, given ecosystem diverse, it's far more resilient to insect and disease or other maladies, you know, and so. Well, and, that's, that's what we want to select for here is yeah. diversity and, you know, to really repair kind of what was wrong yeah. with the forest oh. here. In Seneca, this is Cahadigal, okay? So in the forest. Nice. Yeah, Cahadigal. You guys lucked out. See here? This is a swamp white oak. Yeah, I think we have a, a plenty of swamp white oak on ours. That's nice. Yeah. Real nice. It's got some holes in it, but I think it's. Oh, just, that's. I think it's woodpeckers just. Wood, around. We have lots of woodpeckers, and they're like, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's sapsuckers doing that. Yeah. 
Oh. Does, does that harm the tree or is that? Well, it doesn't do any good, but it doesn't harm it per se, because yeah. it's, it's like when you cut lumber, you will see like um, what they call bird peck will be like little dots in there, but the tree grows right over it. So, yeah. but this is gypsum moss, egg mass right here. Oh, Okay. should we take it off now? Yep. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Done. I don't like those. No. So but. here's our next gen white pines. <laughs> yeah. Now the, the, the pine, you know what I'm looking at is all these, you got the red maple here, which are pretty grungy looking. Yeah. And they have all been cut before. You see multiple stems? Mm -hmm. So that tells you they've been cut before and they sprouted back. And so when they sprouted back, what was formerly a much nicer formed tree, they sprouted back you know, to these more inferior uh, type situations. And uh, there's a lot of uh, stump sprouts here. Yeah. And when you see this yeah. classic rectangular uh, excavations, that's the that's, uh, Pelly Woodpecker. Wow, And that's they were cool. after for ants in there. See the heart, see this is heart rod inside there? Yeah. Okay. And ants uh, are a major contributor to that. There's a heart rot fungus but the ants are also doing their thing in there. Yeah, so anyway, the... And this is actually fairly recent that we, that this happened. Yeah. yeah. You yeah, can the, still smell the yeah. pine. Yeah, I got my fingers by. Yeah. <laughs> Serious stuff. I look at them, boy, they're really... Tell you what, that's a lot of work to get after a couple of ants. We said, oh my goodness, that's crazy. The amount of like, it's my the full hand, like it had yeah. to chisel that hard. It's, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, <laughs> They're incredible. Yeah. Hard way to earn a living, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Now, right there, I just it just caught my eye. You see the young white pine? Yeah. You have all these other white pine here. Yeah. Okay, those are field invaders, okay? They've, yeah. They've invaded this, you know, basically a field. Right. Okay, this is the, their offspring. And the the field invaders tend to be really limmy, okay? and. Uh, and you also get um, uh, white pine weevil. Yeah. Okay, because the weevil is attracted. See, this tree has been weevilled a number of times. Like, if you look up there, do you see where it, it, it jays out? And then here. Yeah, the J. Yeah. Yeah, and then here a J. And here, yeah. a bunch of them. Yeah, and the so J this, here. So this is, while this was growing, this has been weevilled where it killed the top leader probably Probably six, seven times. I never heard weevil used as a verb before. Yeah. It's been weeveled. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's been beetled. It's been weeveled. Yeah. It's been yeah. it's been caterpillared. Yeah. yeah. And so so this is a um, uh, example of you know it grew in the sunlight and that's why. Yeah. So this guy, uh, contrary to that, uh, it has no weevil damage. So we should promote this one. Oh yeah. yeah. And because this one. And it's one stem. Exactly, one stem, and and because it has shade on it yeah, it's, from the trees, yeah. this this is an ideal situation for that young white pine, because it's gonna it's it's got shade around it, but not too heavy. Uh huh. Um, and when you keep in mind too that the it's still got a lot of abundant sunlight on the south side. Right. Okay. And then the rest of this is shaded, so what happens is that it's gonna just shoot right up through. And, and and rise above these trees. They'll go right up through there. So do uh, we need to remove any of the ones around it eventually? No, no. no. I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't touch anything. Would they also act as protectors for this tree? That maybe a insect would rather go to a tree like that and then leave this one. Yeah, yeah. They, they'll see once the the trees get above like um, forty odd feet or so, mm -hmm. the the weevil damage uh, weevil tend to avoid them then. Hmm. They they prefer shorter trees. And uh, that's why if you see this one here, yeah. an example, you, you're up uh, what, 20 feet or so, yeah. then there's no more weeding. No more, yeah. yeah. Exactly, so. It's like too windy up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think it's be, in part because when a tree is younger and it's got this vigorous leader going up, mm -hmm. the sugar content is higher then because that's where the growth is mm -hmm. right there. And so the weevil is attracted to that 
And so... Just like aphids and things would be attracted to the growth tips and stuff. Exactly. And even when you're foraging, you're going for the more... Yeah, ex grow, exactly. Grow, ...growing yeah. parts. Yeah, exactly. And then what's this guy right here who's growing to the right now? The, the three... Yeah. That's a red maple. That's a red maple yeah. as well. But that one had been cut down and... Yeah. ...you know, sprouted back up. Yeah. If you see multiple stem tree... Yeah. ...then it's it's almost certain that it was cut before. Yeah. yeah. Does that also include a deer eating it? Yeah, when it's very young. Yeah. When yeah. it's very young, then it can also perform this yeah. type of... Because yeah. you'll see some of the trees, they'll start putting out sprouts down exactly. below. You know, even with the honeysuckles that yeah, we take the stump, out, they'll, yeah. they'll start getting like bushier, you know, whatever. This, this right here... Oh, look at that damage. That's Well, this is actually a nectary canker right here. This tree you want to cut down. Okay. Because this fungus spores will spread. So should I uh, spray it. Should I do yeah. it? get out of the way? So oh, yeah. oh look at that, look at that. Ah, oh, <laughs> my first I'd spray. Bigger dot than that, huh? Oh you think so? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that. There you go. There you go. Now <laughs> Yeah. This one's got some two hands. Yeah. Two arms. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Because that's not similar as like the multi stems. This one's like, it's growing no, it's low, like, but. Yeah, I, I can't explain why the two. Yeah. A lot of times when trees are under stress, they'll put out sprouts, but. They probably should have been cut off really early on, right? Yeah. To promote the main trunk. Yeah. But, you know, the trouble is, and I'll tell you this about tri trimming, is that if you cut these, for example, Okay, the, you have to be careful how you do it because if you cut too close down here, mm. then the rain will hit that and then fungi are attracted to moisture. Right. And it goes into the main trunk. Right. So, yeah, so it's like, um, I personally, uh, I just leave it alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's a nice find. You know what this is? This is great for wildlife. Now this tree, I would definitely trim around this to give it more light. Okay. You know what this is? Is this an amelanchier? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Service berry. Yeah. Yeah. And look how it's. Yeah. I love the. Form. This is one of my favorite little trees. We, we want want to actually plant more amelanchier and uh, cornus in this air in the area that's where the spruces are. Yeah. Because we'd like to see more. Uh, native flowering trees. For sure. So then we want to clear this area a little what bit. What I would do is, because you don't want branch to rub or not. Yeah, that's a that Trim branch. These... Yeah, because that branch doesn't need to be there anyway. Exactly. Right so I'm going to just just get that branch just to. Well, I trim all these right around. Yeah. yeah. Is it, this is a, the hawthorn, hawthorn. which yeah. is another good wildlife tree. Yeah, it is. You might just, be, because they're dangerous, yeah. And trim up some lower limbs so yeah. you don't get impaled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, so, uh, like this one's straight at my eye. Yeah. 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 Now, Hawthorne w wants some light, yeah. so you might consider um, cutting this down. There's another service berry right here. Yeah, nice. Which that will benefit from that. Berry, yeah, you know? yeah, so that's good. This guy put out lots of sprouts. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Yeah. Given the size of that, that was a saw timber tree. So he must have uh, had the logging done yeah. and you know, told him to cut whatever. Well, what is the history, not to take you off the yeah. trees, but what is the history of this area? Do you know? Like, did, was there a lot of people who moved in here that kind of wanted to farm and then, you know, packed up and said, hey, this is not good farming potential and then sold all their trees or? There's been a convoluted history where people came into our, it went back to the time of the Revolutionary War. Yeah. Okay, where um, Washington and the, and the government after the war, uh, like the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, in what became New York State, and in Northern Pennsylvania too, but say stick to New York State, they, during the Revolutionary War, they uh, really had no way to pay a lot of the soldiers. Mm -hmm. So they 
basically gave promissory notes about uh, we'll pay with land. And so, and, and they said, okay, where, where are we gonna get the land? And that's where Washington sent uh, Sullivan, Sullivan up here in yeah. Clinton and to get rid of the Indians so they could uh, give the soldiers the land. And also you had major land speculators get their grubby fingers up. And they, they were basically in cahoots with the generals and stuff. And see, it's like the soldiers got maybe, maybe 160 acre tracks. And uh, a lot of the soldiers end up never even wanting the land. They just sold it to speculators or whatever. And, and so uh, the speculators not only picked up those parcels, but they also, uh, like the generals, were given huge parcels, like maybe 3,000 acres or 10,000 acres or whatever, 20,000 acres. And so, and so the speculators in concert with the generals and everything, because generals didn't want the land, they had no use for it. Uh, they uh, they started doing major sell-offs then. They just basically would start selling it again. And that was from a set of soldiers, more European settlers, you know, who bought it. And like you go up by Seneca Lake and Watkins, mm -hmm. what's called the Watkins Flint Purchase, there's an enormous area up through there mm. where that was in turn sold off. And um, and so if you look on an old map from uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, you'll see these, like all these little um, very uniform parcels, Yeah. you know. And uh, they, they did it in part so the dispossessed the Indians, mm -hmm. but also when the settlers got here, and of course they had no ecological knowledge or con concerns, they just, um, when they in came into an area, especially lucrative was the um, commercial stands of white pine. Because mm. literally the east was built on white pine. Which is your sacred tree. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So the irony of you know, the symbol of the the Hodinosone yeah. is the white pine, and that was the tree most sought after by the settlers mm. and speculators to, to log. So the, they sought these places, white pine, and and you know, like the hilltops like these around here, uh, and down in the Schwung Valley, uh, they were famous for the, the white pine stands and mm -hmm. the quality of it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they just went after it with vengeance. And so, the the thing with the white pine is that uh, they first came in on settlers' property, and the settlers would uh, use some of the smaller ones for their cabins and everything. But all the nice white pine that was sold so that they could uh, pay for farm implements or livestock and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's how they did it, and uh, and this lumber or logs, which became lumber, um, was in turn used to build the towns and everything, you know, so. Yeah. so and, um, and I might tell you this, that the majority of land around here, not only was it wastefully cleared, but uh, it was also cut for firewood, because everybody burned firewood back then. And it's, it's phenomenal how much, when you figure every family, if they needed, say, 10 cords of wood, because that's main fuel, everything they did with it. If you had 1,000 families, that's 10,000 cords of wood. Yeah. And and that takes one half lot of land to produce 10,000 cords, and that's each year, mm. you know? And there was a vastly a lot more than 10,000 families, mm. or 1,000 families there, you know? And so it, the, mm. the forests were cleared very, very quickly. So one thing I'm, working on is a Indian history map of the Finger Lakes region. Oh, that would be tremendous, yeah. And so, yeah. I'm, so I'm doing all these things like where, you know, Sullivan went, yeah. where some former Indians' villages and settlements were, um, like where Red Jacket lived or was born, you know, yeah. just anything I can think of. And then on the borders, 
uh, I have on there. Uh, it's one of my many projects, but <laughs> and it's like halfway, you know, halfway done. Yeah. And and so it's like on the borders, I have on there, like um, because half the Finger Lakes region was Seneca yeah. territory. Okay? Yeah. And so I said, well, then Seneca's, and then a strip of Cuga, then the strip of Onondaga, and maybe a tiny corner up Anida, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, well, uh, half the border will be devoted to uh, like Seneca. So mm -hmm. for example, so I'm gonna put uh, like a hawk on there mm -hmm. and I'll say gajitos, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. And, uh, or I'll put um, the um, wolf, mm -hmm. which is the for the different For the different clans? Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. And then, and then maybe some other um, things like the headdress would be Gastola, yeah. you know. So just a few things that would be culturally important, but yeah. also have the Indian name. You know? Who are you working with on that? Just me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need somebody else to get the fire under your bum to like oh, get it finished. I'm building a house. <laughs> Plus I'm writing a book about the forest and oh. its ecology. Oh my gosh. And that's illustrated. You know, oh my I, goodness. I do artwork. Yeah. By the way, look at how nice that pine is. That is magnificent. That is a beautiful pine that right there. That is what we want. And that, Straight as an arrow. It's a perfect yeah. example of how pine grow in this one, two phase. Yeah. You know, the first one is Lemmy gets, then these guys grow in the shade and look how fine they are. Yeah. See, that's, that's that'll be a monarch someday. Yeah. And there's another service how, card. How, how long will it take to be a monarch? <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> like how old do you think these are? Like when were the, can you tell from not cutting them? Like, I would are say these... they're probably 50 years old or 50, so. 50, okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. yeah, these big ones, yeah. yeah. And then, because we're wondering, like, how, how long does it take to become a monarch? Because they become tall very quickly. Yeah. But the question is... Well, see, because like, every how... species has its own strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, little plants, big plants, yeah. and animals. And so what it is here is that these guys, their strategy is to grow tall as fast as possible to get above the canopy. And we, we can tell that this tree... It's well on its way mm -hmm. to being above the canopy, probably in a few years. Yeah. I see some evidence that it did get weevil. Yeah, I see here, and I see that one too. See that one that goes like yeah. a, like a bu bu bubble. Yeah. So yeah, when you get closer, you could see the bowing out. I yeah. guess. Yeah. But the. Um, uh, but weevil damage is not going to kill it. Oh no, back. no. In fact, uh, it's like like this guy here. Yeah. The, these these guys here because. They may be growing a little bit even more shade on them. They have less likelihood of getting weevilled. Right, you know? okay. I'll tell you something here. This is very important. This this right here. This like duff layer? Yeah. In in our language, that's called orenda. Orenda, yes. I okay. love that name. Yeah, it's, it's one good. of my favorite words. Oh, I love it. Ataraxia and orenda. Those yeah. are my two of my favorite words. Yeah. Yeah, and so the rinda is what's called the, the mystery, the mystic potence. Because they knew back then, you know, that that the all the life in the forest, and the forest was their world, came from here. Mm -hmm. And everything in the forest returned to that. Mm -hmm. So it was so, cycle, so that was the, the place of great recycling mm. right here. And so, and so the, like the woodpecker was revered because it was a major component of that breaking things down and into the arinda again. Yeah, so, so this, and you can see when you're in a, a really old forest that the arinda is really thick. Yeah. And, and so this, uh, nothing's more important to growing the forest than, than the healthy orinda. Yeah. You know, that's what's really critical. And so maple is a good soil builder, especially sugar maple. There's a lot of calcium in its leaves, but this is a good soil builder and it just takes 
generations for this duff layer to, to, um, to, for the Arinda to build up again. Yeah. And, um, and so, because the deficit here is that you're countering the, um, the, the high clay content. So it's kind of basically a waterlogged soil. Yeah. And so the Arinda can offset that. Yeah, like almost like the native natural compost. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now this, uh, I'll just tell you something from a timber standpoint. Yeah. Okay. If I saw this tree, it's not the most thrifty tree. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's um, it's like when it's all you've got, then yeah. then you you know, and you enjoy it. So, uh, in a In a, in a setting like a, the logging job I'm marking now, I would debate whether to mark it or not right. because of there's too many dead limbs on it. Yeah. And but it's all we got. <laughs> yeah. When it's, <laughs> when it's got too many dead limbs, yeah. that's invitation for decay to set in. Right. Okay. But um, when you're assessing whether something is uh, uh, suitable for logs, it has to be 12 inches in diameter at the small end, which means, you know, you never include the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's always what's up here, mm -hmm. because that's where you're, you saw straight through, okay? And so, so the, um, it has to be, in order to be a saw log, it has to be 12 inches in diameter. So, so in other words, where's 12 inches on this guy? So you'd, you'd step back and say, okay, I could get out of this. Just, you see that one dead limb right there? Yeah. That's about 12 inches right across there. Okay. Okay. So I can get a 16 foot log out of that. Yeah. That's tree. Okay. And so, so you know, I'd say, yeah, okay, good. So, so it would be cut, cut down um, and hauled out in the top portion there, the last six feet or whatever, would end up for firewood, then that we'd leave the top here. Right. Yeah. You know, but for us, because we don't have as many ash in this oh, one. Oh, you'd keep it. We keep it, and we keep don't as need long it as for possible. wood. Or, yeah. Uh, you know. Keep as long as possible for yeah. a seed tree. Just hope the boar doesn't find it. Yeah. I don't see any uh, damage yet. No, but if you, I guess when we walk down, we'll be able to see more damage. And my question is, if you see a lot of damage, should you just take it out? Remove this one? No. No. no? I'm going to point out something very important. Uh, you see the loose bark? Yeah. This is a very important source of food for like chickadees and such. Oh. Because insects hide under that. Yeah. Okay. And because uh, it's warm, they think they're protected. Yeah. And while they're overwintering, the chickadees will explore under this loose bark to to uh, look for bugs. Well, I we love our chickadees, so oh, yeah. we'll keep that. Yeah, and so I, I always tell people, don't cut a tree down for firewood mm -hmm. uh, if it has a lot of loose bark on it mm -hmm. until the bark's gone, mm -hmm. then then cut it because mm -hmm. it has no use to the birds then. Uh, now this one I would cut because it has cankers in it. So I would take that out. This aspen right here, okay. Is this the big tooth or? Yeah, um, or... let's see. They are likely the big tooth. I don't know if we can find If we find leaves. a leaf that hasn't decomposed. This is an aspen leaf, right? Yeah. But I don't know if it's from this tree. Pretty likely. It's hard to find. Yeah. Yeah. For wildlife, about the most important tree you can have. That's a cool dead one right there. Knobs on it. That's neat. That could be like a sculpture. <laughs> yeah. And then here's some more of our ash. Yeah. I'm really quite surprised that these have not been That's, if you Half do that, that tells you how the you can hear the resonance in there. Yeah. That's why the, oh, yeah. the transfer of shock, see? Yeah. 
That's why ash was so sought after for baseball bats and tool handles. We were banging on one with the uh, uh, Jamin, the basket weaver uh -huh. in the area. Oh yeah, I yeah. know Jamin. Yeah. yeah. And then these hickories just look great. Oh, they're great. Yeah. They are so important for the wildlife and ecology of the forest. Th this one's uh, different. Bark. Look at the flaky bark on this. That's an ironwood. That's another ironwood, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's not the muscle wood, that's ironwood. Yeah, different. So basically, when you're walking through this forest, you would really only thin out you're, you wouldn't thin just to thin. You'd thin out the trees that are dying or diseased, especially yeah. when you're looking at it from a conservation and optimizing the health of the forest perspective. Yeah. Well, so it'd be a light touch, essentially. Oh yeah, and what I would do is, any really desirable tree, say this hickory or whatever, yeah. okay, I, I'd look around it and, and say, okay, what's the assessment, so to speak? One is, it's getting plenty of light from the south. Mm. So it's it's very happy there, okay? And the aspen on the back side of it, they're struggling, you know, they're, they'll start dying off gradually here. And, and that's fine, you know, it's like a gradual process here. You want to imitate what nature is doing. That's, that's one of the primary things I do in, in, in my forestry is, when I mark trees for cutting, it's because I am imitating what nature does. Like I mark out a tree that's diseased or defective, that's what nature's gonna take out. Any tree that's got a narrow crotch like that, I mark out because those are gonna split and nature will take those out. Mm -hmm. Any tree that's leaning, uh, signs of uprooting, anything like that that I think nature's gonna take out, I'll take them mm -hmm. out. A tree that's the top is dying on it, too many dead branches. Mm -hmm. I'll take that out. Mm -hmm. And so, so you, you focus in on where are your best trees, what can I do to enhance them? Mm -hmm. you know, and certainly one way is to get rid of any uh, diseases in your, in your forest. And, yeah. and what, are you, what are your thoughts also, like this is a pretty clear walking area. Um, yeah, it's very open woods. So, uh, you know, is it is it beneficial as we start to move the deer fence back to start trying to enrichment plant or do some hugel mounds or to build some more interest down below to have like not just tall layers, well, but you know, well, actually uh, like lo some lower shrub layers. I think you've got a severe deer browsing problem here. For yeah. A while. Which is why we want to extend the deer uh -huh. fence into. How, what, what makes you notice that? Because it's too open, the understory here. And I've been observing deer poop. Yeah, there's a lot of about. black beans around the area. Yeah, <laughs> black beans. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, because of that, I say, okay, you know, that's, um, this soil, it may sound counterproductive, but it benefits from some disturbance. So, if you, do you have a tractor? Not yet. We okay. have an AT, a UTV and that's about it right now. Okay. Yeah. Because what I would do is, every so often in here, yeah. just disturb the soil. Right. And do that, especially near uh, some hickories, uh, any tree that's desirable because seedlings, Love a bare seed bed. Right, and that, and actually, this prevents seedlings. The, du the this duff can, like is prevents things from growing up, right? Right. Sometimes, so yeah. you need to. And so, if you go yeah. back to the way the forest was mm -hmm. uh, before people screwed it up, <laughs> so <clears throat> back then you had large herbivores in the forest: elk and buffalo, right, running around, uh, animals rooting. I mean, bears were so common back then, always digging up things. Um, and they were disturbing the soil all over the place. And so, so we have to do that. That's why when I'm doing a logging job and my guys are there, we, we cut the trees and they're dragging the logs through the soil, that's music to my ears because they're creating bear seed beds all through mm. the forest. Mm. And, and the soil disturbance, 
You go back there years later, that's where, that's where the things are regenerating. Right. And also I'll tell you another thing is what you do here is that there's a great lack of large biomass on the floor here, mm -hmm. forest floor. Mm -hmm. So I highly encourage you to do some thinning, like let's say for example, like this tree here, you cut it down and leave it, just mm -hmm. bam, leave it. Yeah. So let that decay back into the soil. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so you have an ideal situation here. Beautiful ash. Yeah. Beautiful red maple. Yeah. Here, give me your paint here. I'll, yeah. I'm gonna yeah. do some Get stuff here. I'll show you <laughs> what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Bug got sprayed. <laughs> uh, yeah, they did some serious cutting here for, uh, I don't know, firewood and also timber bolt. Look at the bottom of that. Now that is cool. That is really neat. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Yeah. this fence away from these trees and obviously some of the trees gobbled up the fence yeah what's the best way to free the trees in a way you know? I don't know if you can y yeah if it's been really on there yeah then you yeah like you can see the barbed wire in there yeah you're not gonna get it out yeah but the tree is okay still oh yeah okay yeah. but I am getting a good sense as to how you're reading the, uh, the forest a bit more I'm definitely that's in my book ball I'll, I'll, I would love to show you guys what I'm working on with it. But it's like everything practical from soup to nuts. About. Yeah. Oh, but well, if you ever want somebody to review your book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've written three books myself, so oh, yeah? I, I know the process. And oh, it's always man. nice to have other people read it. And oh, yeah. Provide feedback because you're so close to the text. You often need a yeah. helping hand. That is cool. That's a neat. That's a neat. I think it's probably just uh, concrete and stuff. Looks like they probably... Something. Yeah, it's like concrete and stone. Now yeah. this is a shell bark hickory. This is a shell bark? Yeah. How do you know? Because the bark is much tighter than on the, sh on the shag. So this is, is this shag and this is shell? Yeah. And is this shag? That's a shag. Okay. Yeah. So we do have another hickory. Yeah. Okay. You got an oak over there. Yeah. Very nice. Because we know how important the oaks are in the forest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For diversity. Yeah. Sorry, that's my last name, so uh, I always, I always mind, remind them how important oaks are. <laughs> Your last name is Oak? Oaks, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. This hickory here, not the easiest thing to cut down, but trouble is when you cut this, it's gonna go right toward that oak. So this basswood can stay? Definitely. It looks like it has nice animal, it looks oh, like a, a... Basswood stays for the wildlife. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, that's a premier wildlife tree. And the smell. And the smell yeah. of the, of the and flowers. And also, it's a good tea. It's the first one we've seen. It's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so that alone says you keep it. This is magnificent, really nice. Yeah, the form of it, very healthy crown. It's an ideal tree. This is a problem because... It might split and fall. Yeah, and it would fall right on that. Yeah. So, here again, I would girdle it. Girdle, okay. Yeah. Now, can you explain the girdling a bit more? What do you exactly do? You're gonna cut in to, through the sapwood, okay? Yep. This is gonna have probably that thick of sapwood. And that's like the softer part that's still kind of growing and alive. Yeah, that's the live part. The harder part in the middle. And you're yeah. stopping the flow of the juices. Right. So this dies and just gradually decays away. Okay, and, and then the hard part in the inside will keep it up. And then it just... Yeah, yeah. And, and it's... Um, because unless... I mean, the ideal is, if you unless you're really good at felling the tree, the tree if you girdle it, at least... It gives you some borrowed time. Yeah. Because hickory, though, decays very easily. 
uh, you will invite decay starting in pretty quick. Right. So, so that's that's a trade-off there. I would say this: there must be goldenrod nearby here. There's a lot of goldenrod. Yeah, because um, these have died most likely from ash dieback, which is goldenrod is the secondary host for it. Oh. So, so we're closer to roads and everything. Yeah. Ash tend to do best when they're more remote. There's an old ironwood here. And here we have some of the uh, trout lilies coming mm -hmm. out. See, we saw them yeah. the other day. There is a magnificent hickory. Look okay. at That is magnificent. This hickory. Yeah, yeah, this is what you want. Okay. That is a beauty. Although he's got a little stem on the other side. <laughs> yeah, that's the, um, the form, everything is perfect on this tree. That's what you want. Well, that's quite a tree right there. Yeah, it's not in perfect shape. No, but, but for a couple hundred years old, I guess. A couple hundred. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, this tree is a, this tree is all by itself for many, many years. You know? Well, wow, that's a, that's a real monarch here. What I would do is, yeah, look at this. This is where a major limb was off, came off, and it tried to heal in itself. Wow, that is a beauty. Yeah, that's something to be proud of. I know we are. Oh man. We wish we had more of them. Oh yeah. <laughs> Good God, yeah. Is this like Smith Woods material? I don't know. We have. Well, it's there old yet. as. I'm sure it's old as. Uh, Things like that. growing on it. Yeah. You know? Oh, it's, it's, it's an ecosystem into itself. I'll tell you a little story. It's like the reason why this survived for, uh, all these years was because that it was useless, except for maybe a boundary tree or something like that. But its main way it survived was it was useless. And there was a Chinese philosopher named Mencius was a contemporary of Confucius. And, uh, and he was taking his pupils through the landscape in China. And they saw the army down below in the valley. And uh, so one of the, the students said, uh, how can I survive to an old age like you? And he said, you have to become useless. And he goes, what do you mean? And he says, you see the army down below. He says, all those soldiers have a use. And then he said, uh, probably none of them will live to an old age like me. And, uh, and he says, you see this old, old, old tree here. He says, it survived because there's, you can't cut any boards out of it because there's no, it's not straight, you know? And he says, it, and it's too big now to, be able to cut down, and so he says, so it'll survive because it's useless. Yeah. And it's it's very true. The old, the majority of old growth in the east is um, because of uh, is principally beech and hemlock, which had very little use, mm. you know. And so, and so the rarest of the rare is finding like old growth of virgin white pine, yeah. because that was so sought after. Yeah, you know, and that's why. Well, I've seen, I've been to an old growth hemlock forest in Pennsylvania. There's a small one that's close to where my father lives, but I've never seen them grow to the diameter of something like this. Exactly. Yeah, this, this was a pasture tree that grew all by itself yeah. for probably 
well over 100 years. So and you feel sorry for it because it's all here by itself all the I time. I know. But it's a testimony to its endurance. Yeah. I mean, this is a real sacred tree. So I'm wondering if we should extend the deer fence. <laughs> well, I, to, to over in here, I would do whatever I could to see that this regenerates somehow. Yeah. There's so many centuries here. What a monarch, my God. I know, it just, it just, just brightens my oh. day. I mean, this is a real, real gem. And you keep in mind that, see this tree grew in the open, so there's no competition. Right. So it can grow faster than the tree which, you know, is crowded. Yeah. And so, like the white pine and everything, uh, Oh, there, there's some real monarchs there, real, real big ones. Well, I, I'm so, wondering now spot. to kind of um, focus on this tree and to make it like a real focal point in this area. Yeah. Maybe possibly extending the deer fence. Well, uh, I would put something around this. Yeah, or, or actually to create a fence around it, its own fence, so that yeah. it could leave more white oak seeds. And then my question is, these are all small, but do we take any of the trees away from it around? Yeah, I was just about looking at that because you see like this hair? Yeah. That's going right up into the crown. Right. So so let's do some tree marking here. This tree became established before, see deer were decimated from this area. Yeah. So this tree became established before deer became a came back here and sense. became common again. Yeah. Otherwise it wouldn't be here. So. so how old do you think it is? Like. That one? Yeah. Probably 75 years old or better. Wow. Yeah. This is a black birch. Yep. Uh, we'll leave it. They kind of die. They don't live that long, right? No, but sometimes they do. But we'll give that these events of the doubt here. Okay. Because you don't have hardly any. So, yeah. Yeah, that's one heck of a tree right there, boy. Magnificent. Well, I'm glad we got a chance to show it to oh you. Oh my God. It might have been worth the effort of coming out. <laughs> oh, it, it certainly was. What a tree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at the crown on that thing. I know. Thank God. What a monarch. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Really something else. That's a good one. Let's just see. There's a nice red oak right there. Yeah. That one right there, the one smooth that's smooth bark kind of going up. Yes. Yeah, that's a beauty. Yeah. Good. That's real good. So it's not all bad. Oh no, no, you got some good stuff. It's the forest is trying to heal itself. But you see that ash in the distance, right on the road? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's not good. Is that the borer? Or do you think that's something else? Yeah. Yeah, boy. That's real classic right there, the boar. Yeah, so isn't it strange that they have much more boar out here, but not in the woods? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So we should get rid of that, or should we just let it be? Well, until it falls. they're in there. Yeah. Still, I'd get rid of it. So how do you get rid of it though? That so it doesn't the borers don't like come out and feast on our other ashes that are in Burn there. Burn it. Burn it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Burn it as firewood or burn it just to burn it. I'd burn it right away. Okay. And yeah. these two, I think, are, are starting to get it on the outside here. So you'd cut it down and then throw just, it in a pile and burn it. Yeah. yeah. Cut it up and throw it in a pile and burn yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, these guys be on the open. Yeah. Yeah, I see up there further up. Yeah, I'm further up and then this one too. Yeah. So I think like, uh, my fear is that it spreads more deeply into the woods. Yeah, yeah, right here, you can see it. Yeah, there, see right there. It's going after the ones that are most exposed. Yeah. So I think that's clear of what we want to do. We want to really select for 
some of those statement trees like that no, white oak yeah. and then just see anything that's growing up in her crown mm -hmm. to give her some space yeah. to uh, even consider uh, extending the fence so that the white oak seedlings don't become forage for the, the white-tailed oh, deer. Yeah, yeah, because they'll, uh, oh, of everything you have here. Yeah. Maybe the arborvitaes they love to eat. Well, we don't care about the arborvitaes. Yeah. They could eat those. Yeah, and the white oak, that's what they're after. Yeah. yeah. We might even plant the arborvitaes so they can eat them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Now this is what we want to return to meadow. Yeah. It's, but he brought in a lot of tile drainage and uh, oh, gravel and then some geotextile material. So we're, de we're in debate now. How do you best establish it? Do you take out just the geotextile and you leave the gravel and the, uh, and the pipes underneath? Is the gravel all through? Gravel throughout n nine acres. How much tons? Oh my tons? God. 100,000 tons of gravel oh brought in. Oh my God. We want to return it to meadow. Uh, yeah. Now the solidago and everything has moved in, but we don't want a full solidago forest here. <laughs> uh, How deep is this gravel? Four to eight inches. I would plow furrows. Okay. That's what I would do. Yeah. You know, but we'd love to get some bobo links in oh, here. Oh yeah. And maybe Orioles. <laughs> well, if you had a, a sandy, um, like gravel bar type thing. Yeah a lot of dirt, exposed dirt along the edge of the pond, then the killdeer will come. Well, the killdeer are here already. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, we, I heard them before I saw them. But and I see you've got the honeysuckle. We're getting the honeysuckle and the multiflora rose. We probably pulled out 600 of them, and we have more piles, and we burned, started burning them uh, before the winter. We really appreciate your time oh, yeah. and your insights into the woods oh, yeah. because we're, oh. we're, we're eager to get the deer fence extended. We want to get the planting, starting to get some oh, planting yeah. done. Yeah. We're up against the time on the honeysuckle, but this is all honeysuckle and we've removed most of it. Good God. You know, and, and to, to let some of these trees breathe. I'll tell you something with this honeysuckle is, um, you have to get it up by the roots, otherwise it'll sprout back. We've been pulling it out as much by the roots as possible with our UTV. That's become the... Oh. But, you know, you, sometimes you still get a root. Oh, it's amazing. You, you still get a root in the, the ground and you're yeah, trying I to pull it. Yeah, see a root up like that. I actually sprained my finger oh, from, yeah, from it. you know, ripping it out. Oh, my God. So we, at first we started cutting them and then we said, oh, why don't we use our UTV to pop there them out? There you go. We have our homework to do with our forest. Yeah. It's got a lot of work. We got a lifetime, that's what we say, it's a lifetime project. It is. It's like generational project. Yeah, that's tr for sure. We We just feel like, the folks here, they had one way of using it, and there's some really interesting plantings. They put the ponds in. Oh, the ponds are fantastic. Yeah, and they really kicked the ball down the the, oh. the field for us, and now we're gonna kick it the rest of the way. There you go. Um, do you have many turtles? I haven't seen turtles yet. We have lots of amphibians. Yeah, a lot of frogs. We got a lot of frogs. Peepers. Peepers, oh. bufos. I peepers. love peepers. I know, they're my fave. Oh my God. We got some, I think we had a leopard, leopard <laughs> frogs, we got bufos, Americana. We did, they cool. Were, uh, and then we saw uh, spotted salamanders. Very and, nice. Yeah. That's very nice. And then this is amazing too. Yeah, oh yeah. It's two and a half acres. That's a, that's a real, I can't wait to come back and <laughs> really look at these.